talking about some of the fundamentals of what a cloud is, the different types of clouds, and how to use the cloud. I'm joined here today. This is Josh Frazier. I'm the Vice President of Business Development. Uh, today I'm joined by Yuri Butnik, who's one of our evangelists on the business development team, as well as David Welch, our sales engineer. And also on the Q&A logs, we have both Matthew Small and Hunter Williams. Uh, as usual, please feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar. You can do so via the chat window in the lower section of your GoToWebinar viewer. Uh, also, the slides and the recording, as well as all of our past webinars, will be made available at rightscale.com slash webinars. And we're more than happy to provide you with a follow-up live demo one-on-one. -on -one. Just simply contact us at sales at rightscale.com. So today's agenda, um, we're going to start by talking about some of the fundamentals and the basics about cloud computing. So really introduce you at a very high level to what it's all about and why customers are embracing the cloud. Then we're going to spend some bit of time talking about cloud management systems, specifically RightScale, where they fit in the ecosystem and why customers are using them. Uh, and then we're going to take you through kind of a, a sequential process of some basics in terms of launching a server in the cloud. Uh, how do I access an image? How do I launch it? How would I configure a server? And then finally, we'll finish off by dealing with multiple uh, server environments and various ways you can manage them. So again, feel free to ask questions at any time. And now I'm going to turn things over to Yuri Butnik, who's going to introduce us to cloud computing. Hello, everyone. Um, before I get started, I'm actually going to talk to you a little bit about what cloud computing is and how you can use it in your companies. For those of you on this uh, webinar, I'd like to let you know that if you want to review it again later, we're going to make a copy of this available in our website. Just uh, check on one of the last slides, we'll show the URL, but there's a whole webinar section in our website where you can see not only this one, but an archive of all the prior ones that we've done. So back to the subject of cloud computing. Um, we're actually going to give you some demos of some of the capabilities, but I think it will be useful to set a baseline of what we mean by the different technologies that we're talking about and how they are useful. This idea of cloud computing is having uh, virtually infinite resources that you can garnish from the cloud by not having to manage hardware, server storage infrastructure, being able to make either API calls or using a graphical user interface or a command line to very quickly provision service and storage. And the innovation is not just on the technology side, on the use of virtualization, but also on business models. Is the idea that you are uh, working on their utility pricing model, pay as you go so that when you're no longer using server resources, you can release those and you are no longer incurring those costs. So what you're looking here is what happens when somebody's trying to put together a data center project. You're going to lease some space and acquire some equipment. Servers, routers, firewalls, switches, intrusion detection systems, load balancers, you name it. What's interesting here is that these are fixed assets that cannot easily be changed and they're usually rather costly. So what is the dilemma that we see here when somebody's planning some infrastructure? It's capacity planning. Usually you have to take some guesses at how much you need in terms of resources to be able to satisfy demand that is difficult to ascertain. When you buy equipment, you usually have to buy it in big tranches or lumps. And that's what you see on this blue line, the stair step shape. Usually you have to forklift whole upgrades in there. However, capacity itself is almost impossible to predict. Anybody that runs any kind of public facing website will tell you that not only is the day to day capacity very difficult to ascertain in advance, you, uh, above and beyond that, you never know when you're going to be mentioned on, on uh, Twitter, somebody slashed out or ditch your website, one of the social uh, bookmarking sites, your company gets mentioned in the news, and uh, you could have 5x, 10x, a tremendous amount of capacity that you were not expecting. So these situations create a couple of scenarios that companies need to contend with. The first one you see here denoted with the green line is having a lot more capacity than your actual demand at any given moment. What, what this creates is a case where you do not have, you, you have way more uh, server capacity at that moment, therefore you are not making an efficient use of your capital. Economists call it opportunity cost because you could actually use that, that budget, that, uh, those resources in something that perhaps makes you more competitive in the marketplace. 
or a different scenario that's perhaps even worse. You might find yourself having more demand in your systems at one moment than the capacity that you have. So in a case like this, you might have uh, your website slowing down, you might be breaking internal or external SOAs and not being able to meet your business goals at that moment. So this idea of cloud computing and being able to automatically provision more system resources on demand allows you to more closely mirror your demand at that moment with your capacity. And notice that the yellow line goes up, but it also comes down. This is uh, a graphical representation of, of what I was mentioning before. When your uh, demand on your resources decreases, you can actually release some of the servers that you may not need at that moment. And because you are looking at a pay-per-use model, you are therefore it's therefore costing you less when you have uh, when you have less traffic on your different systems. When people talk about cloud computing, sometimes they mean different things. So it's useful to talk about the different types of clouds and, and how people approach them. Public clouds is this concept of companies that make the server resources available out there for anybody to garnish. Uh, some of the very well-known ones, for example, are Amazon Web Services that's been doing this for quite a while. There's also Rackspace that's been in the data center business for a long time. They're not releasing their own cloud service uh, on, their, uh, on their brand called Moso for a uh, group of services called Cloud Service. There's also private clouds. Uh, companies have seen a very successful approach to deploying the servers in this cloud style, cloud philosophy, that they started modifying or building their internal data centers to follow the same kind of approach of virtualization, being able to quickly provision and release resources. And a later development or a recent development is this idea of hybrid clouds. Companies that are building their own private data centers in this cloud style, but do it in such a way that they can uh, now more easily move the server configurations into public clouds, therefore making it possible to when you maximize or when you max out rather your internal capacity, you can then move some of that excess load into external or into public clouds. And even in the public cloud space, sometimes companies use the term to mean slightly or significantly different things. So let me talk about those. We're actually going to get into a demonstration and I want to kind of lay the foundation of the information about what it is that we're talking about to make the demonstration that David's going to give you in a moment uh, that much more useful. There's software as a service that I imagine just about every single person on this phone call has heard about before. The idea that your application is not really running on your own computer, it's coming to you from a service that's hosted somewhere in the cloud again, to use, that, to use the phrase we've been, uh, we, we've been wearing out here this morning. Things like Gmail. Uh, Salesforce is a very popular enterprise application. You no longer have to figure out how to run those services within your own enterprise. Another type of approach for cloud computing is platform as a service. This idea of having a code execution environment. Uh, Google App Engine is a fairly well-known one. Force.com, for example, is part of the company called Salesforce that allows you to build business applications where they will host that business logic, that code that you create for that. And what we're going to be talking about here for the rest of this webinar is infrastructure as a service. The idea that you still have servers and storage in the same way that you know today, but that perhaps you're running in your own data center, but now you can run them in the cloud for a company that's managing that physical layer for you, so you no longer have to uh, have the, the internal expertise to support that hardware. Again, it's companies like Amazon Web Services that have been doing this for quite a while, but also uh, companies that have been entering the space lately, like GoGrid, that is part of a company called SourcePath, uh, in Rackspace that I mentioned earlier with the service, cloud servers from Moso. What we do here at Westfield, by the way, is provide a cloud management system to help companies and individuals that are deploying their servers into the cloud in this infrastructure as a service approach to make their day-to-day -day tasks and their planning a lot easier. So here's a graphical summary of what I was talking a moment ago. Software as a service on the left, platform as a service in the middle, infrastructure as a service with a rectangle on the right. And, and notice the X and the Y axis, how you have a scale of increasing automation and uh, increasing uh, portability there. And there seems to be a, a trade-off in the different technologies that you may choose. So let me do a for instance here. In platform as a service, I mentioned Salesforce.com earlier as a software as a service application, but then I talked about Force.com briefly, a code execution environment. 
you can actually build an entire application using their custom platform in a language they call Apex that then they will host and run for you. So it eliminates a lot of the complexity for you, but because it's written in Apex, it's actually not portable. You can't take that anywhere else. On the other hand, if you look at the infrastructure as a service rectangle here on the right, the, the red area on the bottom denotes the capability to have many different clouds that are providing this infrastructure service. What we do is provide a whole suite of automation that David is going to demonstrate, at least some of the things, because we do quite a bit of different things, that actually manages to uh, bridge the gap between the portability and the automation that you might not otherwise have because you're building on a specific platform. And this idea of having these resources that can quickly and inexpensively be, uh, be garnished actually creates a whole new world of uh, possibilities. And let me give you an example, because you have to realize that hardware is no longer a, an expensive or a scared resource. Let's take the scenario of a database failing for a particular company. A database is usually one of rather expensive equipment. So what do people do now? They try to fix in place. You get somebody that's an expert to try to troubleshoot that. In this concept of easily and quickly being able to stand up additional server resources, you can, you can throw up another server, put a known good configuration of your database and a backup of your data, which you should be doing, and get, a, get the system up and going again quickly. And then and only then, if it makes sense, you spend some time in human capital trying to troubleshoot what it is that happened. It's this idea of always being able to roll forward instead of trying to fix in place. So Yuri, it sounds like what you're saying is really a different business process. I mean, the ability to really throw servers at the problem and scale first and then optimize second. Correct. Yeah, th these new technological capabilities actually uh, give you tremendous advantages so that you can more quickly adapt to changing business environments and how the market changes. It's this whole concept of agile deployment. I'm sure many of the people on this phone call here have heard of agile programming, this idea of being able to very quickly iterate to adapt faster. We're taking some those concepts and applying them to deployments of servers now as well. Great. Well, thanks, Yuri. Thanks for that introduction on the cloud in general. Um, let's talk a bit about just cloud drivers. You know, we get asked this question all the time, things along the lines of, you know, is the cloud real? Are companies doing commercial deployments today? So we thought it would be helpful to share some real data that we've gathered from various users of RightScale. Uh, and this is both from our paid as well as our free user base. So this notion of what drives you to the cloud, well, the overwhelming majority here is about scalability. So this is that yellow line that Yuri showed you earlier, the ability to provision resources very quickly on demand when they're needed and only pay for what you use. Uh, but then as important is really this notion of scaling down as well. So deprovisioning uh, becomes a huge driver into this uh, you know, third chunk here, which is cost savings. So you're not spending money uh, frivolously here. You're only spending on what you actually consume. Just to give you a little few snippets here on what some actual customers are doing, uh, we've seen lots of different use cases for the cloud today, and these are across a tremendous breadth of customer types, ranging from small startups to Fortune 100 companies. Um, we've, we've excerpt here just a few, removed company names uh, to preserve confidentiality, but wanted to share with you some of the characteristics of what these use cases are all about. Um, this first one is a social game provider, specifically on Facebook. Uh, this is one of the most popular top ten Facebook games that is out there. They're dealing with massive numbers of highly distributed users. Uh, in this case, they'll get over four million users per day uh, logging into this gaming environment. So highly unpredictable, but massive demand needs and incredible spikes. So without the cloud, they'd be forced to spend incredible amounts of capital to provision the necessary resources to deal with this peak load. Alternatively, by running in the cloud, they have the ability to grow and, as needed, shrink as that demand comes and goes. Uh, the next interesting use case we're seeing a lot in, in financial service sectors as well as pharmaceutical sectors, and it's dealing with kind of grid and batch computing jobs. Um, these companies are typically faced with finite sets of resources in their internal data centers. They need to process lots of jobs. Not all jobs are created equal. So a job is submitted and it was subject to where it fits in the queue as far as prioritization goes, with little to no transparency in terms of when that job could be completed. In the cloud, you have this neutral cost equation. You have the ability to provision resources very quickly, and from a neutral cost equation standpoint, it's the notion of being able to spin up 1,000 servers for an hour for the exact same cost that you'd spin up 100 for 10 hours. 
So in businesses where time is of the essence, you know, if you think about a pharmaceutical company bringing a drug to market, you know, the time it takes in that R&D pipeline is sometimes worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And using cloud technologies, you have the ability to reduce the time to perform these uh, jobs uh, using the cloud. Um, test and dev, another great example, the ability to access substantial resources to do performance testing. Um, we had a customer most uh, interesting use case around the Olympic Games uh, in Beijing. So before the games even started, they were able to provision and do load and performance testing against what ended up being uh, an environment that was 4x the ultimate uh, capacity that was needed. Um, so again, you're faced with a situation where the capital that would have been required uh, to do something similar in a traditional data center environment would have been prohibited, and they would have no idea to really you know, build out the necessary infrastructure uh, to maintain the appropriate performance testing for what ultimately would have happened. And then the, the final use case I wanted to share is around rich media. Um, we have a lot of customers that are doing things around video rendering and video transcoding. And here, similar to the social game provider, you're subject to you know, high fluctuations in demand, uh, unknown peak demand situations. But also, when it comes to kind of paid users, you're dealing with this need to maintain specific SLAs. These businesses simply would not work if a customer submits a request to have a video rendered, and that request is subject to a high degree of variability in terms of when that, um, when that product would be delivered. So those are just four kind of real quick examples of different use cases that we've seen. There are many, many more, but hopefully this gives you a sense of real deployments that are being done today in the cloud. So let's talk about management systems for a second. You know, one thing that we've also heard really from day one, and, and RightScale, uh, just to put this into context, you know, Amazon Web Services launched in August of 2006. RightScale launched in September of 2006. So we've been at this really since day one and focused on addressing the needs of customers that are looking to deploy commercial deployments in the cloud, specifically things around complexity. This is new technology. There are new methodologies being embraced, and customers need and want help. Um, automation is a huge component, and this is also a huge uh, benefit that can be leveraged in the cloud. This notion of monitoring system metrics and having a rules-based system like RightScale that will, on your behalf, do things like run an update, do things like promote a slave database in the case of a master failing, do things like auto-scale up or down depending on traffic needs. And then another key component is this fast on-ramp. You know, a big business value prop of cloud computing is the ability to deploy very, very quickly, get up and running fast, whether it's a test and dev environment or even a production environment. You know, we've had customers that we've seen get up and running with commercial deployments in a matter of days. So this notion of a fast on-ramp is changing the whole way uh, business is done when it comes to uh, embracing cloud computing. So on that note, uh, the right scale system really is a multi-cloud management platform. Um, so multi-cloud in the sense that we support both public cloud infrastructures that Yuri mentioned earlier, companies like Amazon with their Amazon Web Services, Rackspace, uh, Sun, you know, reportedly getting into this space as well. So a variety of different public infrastructure as a services that RightScale has kind of bridged the gap and bundled together and creating a seamless way to manage. Um, however, we haven't stopped there. We've also focused on Eucalyptus. So Eucalyptus is a private cloud enabling technology. And again, the same principles apply. We want to make sure that we are providing a level of abstraction for our customers that make it very, very easy for them to bridge the gap between the applications that they want to run and the cloud infrastructures, be it public or private, that are being provided to them. Uh, the areas of focus can be divided into three chunks. The first is all around automation. You're going to see an example of some of the automation features uh, in a few minutes here, but it's automation around common lifecycle tasks that a system administrator or developer would, would face when, when managing a deployment. Things like running an update, running a patch, dealing with failure scenarios, or a popular one that gets a lot of press, auto-scaling. So within RightScale, we look at automating everything we possibly can through a rules-based platform where actions can be taken on a customer's behalf based on metrics that are being monitored and specific business rules that they set. The next area is around prepackaging. So the cloud is a new frontier, and there's a new way of doing things when it comes to provisioning and managing servers. Uh, we call this cloud-ready solutions. Um, and you'll hear a bit more about this in terms of how you configure a server and the different options there. But what we've found works best is embracing this notion of a server template. Um, which really is a very repeatable process that allows you to get guaranteed results in configure servers and also allows it very easily uh, to embrace lifecycle changes. 
Um, so you'll see some of the server templates in a second when we get to the demo, but we have a whole library of different craft cloud ready solutions around common workloads. And then finally, you know, this focus on uh, a fast on-ramp. Um, we've been at this for a while and we like to take our customers through, you know, really educating through a best practices process. What do they need to know about modifying their application to be cloud friendly? How do they deal with kind of getting up and, up and running quickly? How do they configure the automation parameters in terms of alerts and escalations? So all that is kind of packaged into an onboarding process that we help customers get up and running with. So with that, we're going to take you through um, a few different demos here. And this is going to kind of build, you know, and, and, and be in sequence here. We're going to start with a very simple example of how you would just launch a server in the cloud. Um, in this particular case, it's going to be using a machine image. Um, then we're going to focus on, okay, you've launched a server. Now how do you configure this server? How do you load your specific application on the server and do something with it? And then finally, we're going to end up with really what is a commercial deployment in the cloud, which is all about a cluster of servers. So how would I set up and manage a multi-server environment, and what are the things I need to be concerned with when I do so? So with that, this first demo is launching a server. Um, this is going to be in conjunction with Amazon Web Services. Um, so we're going to show you accessing a bundled machine image. It's called an AMI, an Amazon machine image. We're going to show you how you access that and launch that through RightScale. We're then going to show actually how you would go about installing your application onto that machine image. And then finally, the steps that would need to be taken to rebundle that image and save it for use at a later date. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to David. And David's going to take us through the first demo. Great. Thanks, Josh. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a publicly available AMI, which is, like Josh said, is an Amazon machine image. In this case, I'm going to launch this image in the AWS US cloud, so under images. I see a list of all the publicly available AMIs that I can choose from. In this case, I'm going to take a public one from Amazon, which is going to be a Fedora Core Apache image. So David, this, this is an image that Amazon created and bundled and made available for public use? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Anyone can, uh, you know, anyone can launch the server. But I think it's important to note there are lots of AMIs available in Amazon's catalogs and, you know, for example, from partners as well. So IBM just had an announcement making available several different distributions for DB2, for WebSphere, mm -hmm. and for Informix. So those are also available in these catalogs. Exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this by clicking on the launch button, which is then going to take me to the, the pre-configure screen. And then from there I can add a nickname and, you know, you know determine how many images that I want to launch. Why is a nickname important? A nickname is important because Amazon associates an ID for each image, so a nickname makes it, you know, is more identifiable. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to launch one image, and then I'm also going to attach an SSH key um, to that server, and also I'm going to assign a security group to it. And what, what's a security group? So a security group is a, an ingress firewall for that server, um, and also, I'm, as you can see, that I'm launching a small instance. And you know, with Amazon, you can launch anywhere from a small to a large instance, you know, depending on your memory requirements. And I see availability zone. I mean, availability zones are actually geographically disparate data centers. Is that right? Exactly. So <laughs> Amazon has three separate data centers on the East Coast for the AWS US cloud. Uh, in this case, you know, I don't, I don't really care where, where I'm launching my image at. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this image. And so in the next three to four minutes, you'll see under the recent activity, that the Web2 server is now pending. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I already launched this AMI you know, about 20 minutes ago, so we're going to go ahead and install an application on that server. So as you can see, as you can see, the web the, web, the webinar um, image is up and running. And let's go ahead and take a look at what, you know what's currently there. So right now, I just have my Fedora Core test page, but now you know now I want to install my application. So I'm going to take you through some daily um, development lifecycle tasks when deploying in the cloud. So by clicking on the SSH console button, I'll be given full root level access to my server. So David, this looks very similar to the steps you'd take if this server were located in your own data center or even a managed uh, hosting provider. Is that correct? Um, that's right. Okay, excellent. So with that SSH console, you'll go ahead and load on your application. Um, yes, I'll do that in just a moment here. Yeah. 
Excellent. So I, I think one of the key things to note here is really this notion of full transparency. So even though you're accessing a bundled image that's provided by Amazon, mm -hmm. okay, you now have the ability to modify that much in the same way you would modify your server in your own data center, doing things at the command line. So it'll be the it'll be the exact same process. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to go down and look at look into this AMI. So while we're waiting for that to boot. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that you know the SSH key and the security groups are all set correctly. And as I can see that they are, we just want to make sure that we have port 22 open just so we have access to the server. Okay. Great. So this looks like uh, this looks pretty simple. So you have a variety of bundled machine images that are made available, and it looks like in just a matter of minutes you're able to access that machine image and then bring that to an operational state. Exactly. Okay. But what happens when you're making changes, okay, and then you actually need to, to rebundle that image? What happens then? Are you able to track those changes? You, you know, you have to manually track those changes. Um, so a daily lifecycle task is you make a change to the image, and now in order to persist your data, you're going to have to save that by bundling it. Um, but you're going to be making daily changes, and the bundling process takes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. So normally you're going to make a list of, you know, keep track of all your changes, and then bundle it at the end of the day. Okay, and when you bundle an image, that's being essentially customized to your settings and then stored in uh, your S3 object mm, for exactly. later use? Okay. Exactly. So the image will be, then be stored on S3, which you can later register publicly so anyone else can use your AMI, or else you can just keep it private and then launch that base AMI um, to configure more, more images. Got it. So in S3, for those of you that are not familiar, S3 is simple storage service. That's Amazon's uh, storage environment. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the beauty here is you have the ability to access resources, provision them very quickly, uh, customize them, albeit at the command line, and then store and even republish for someone else to use if you decide to make that image, uh, image public. Exactly. Great. So why don't we jump back now and talk about a, a different way of doing things. So what we've just taken you through was using a machine image. Um, and the problem with machine images is that they're static. So what we do at RightScale is take a fundamentally different approach. And we call this essentially what is cloud-ready servers. Um, and it's all about dynamic configuration. And you're going to see how this works in a second. But the ideas behind this are creating a very repeatable process where you can set design configurations around a server once and then have guaranteed configuration because you're launching servers repeatedly using that exact same server template again and again and again. This makes it very easy when you have to deal with common lifecycle tasks like making a change, making an update. It also makes it considerably easier when you're dealing with things like version control because you have easy ways to go back and do diff and merge of various different updates you've done to your uh, scripts. So let's talk about server templates because server templates are really the brains behind how this all works. Okay. So server templates within RightScale, server templates in RightScale have three different components. Uh, they start with a base machine image. Uh, these are common distributions like Ubuntu and CentOS. Um, from there, they have cloud-specific configurations, things like standard networking tools and security groups. Important to note here, though, these configurations are obviously going to change depending on what infrastructure provider you want to use. So the configurations for Amazon are obviously going to be different from Rackspace and GoGrid, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the key benefits of using server templates is that you're operating at a level of abstraction where right scale is dealing with the complexities of knowing how the behavior varies between clouds and knowing what configuration parameters need to change so that the customers don't need to worry about it. They're operating with that same design methodology regardless of where they're ultimately going to deploy. And then finally, server templates include a collection of write scripts specifically different three different categories of write scripts, boot, operational, and decommission. What these write scripts are doing, and you're going to see an example of a server template and write scripts in a few minutes, but what these write scripts are doing is dynamically configuring that instance at boot time. Everything that needs to be done to that server from installing your application to passing the necessary environment variables so that it knows what database to write to or it has the appropriate credentials to write to that particular database are all done dynamically using these write scripts. Um, because our base images are really including as little as possible, in this particular case, it's usually just the operating system and the intelligence to talk to our platform, you can essentially manage your server on an ongoing basis using this write script architecture. And you're going to see how that works now. 
So David, why don't you why don't you show us an example of a server template, what it consists of, and, and how you would interact with it? Sure. So here I have a Rails all-in-one uh, template. So this template will consist of a Rails application with a database installed on it. But first, I'm going to show you in the cloud section that this server template is meant to run on the EC2 US cloud, and in this case, on a small instance with a base AMI of a write image. But as Josh talked about portability, we want to be able to run this server on you know, multiple clouds. So I'll go ahead and you know, add, an, add a cloud to this server template. And in this case, I'm going to want to run this on the Amazon EC2 EU cloud. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select an image for that, for that server template. And as you can see, this is the exact same public library of AMIs that I just showed you in the previous demo. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to select a write image. Now the importance of a write image is really, it's supported by WriteScale, and it's a stripped down version of an AMI with only the bare necessities and the WriteScale tools on it. And the WriteScale tools enable the communication from your server to our WriteScale das dashboard. So I'm going to go ahead and select the current um, write, write image AMI. And then once I have that all set, I'm going to click Save. So David, just to confirm here, so what you've done is you've taken a single server template, in this case a Rails all-in-one template, that was set to run on Amazon's US cloud, and quickly reconfigured it so that that same server template will run on their EU cloud as well. Exactly. Great. And for those of you that don't know, even though these are obviously both underneath Amazon Web Services, uh, they do share global uh, credentials, logins, and S3 buckets. However, from a compute resource standpoint, they are entirely separate data centers, entirely separate clouds. So this is just an example of how you use server templates, operate at that level of abstraction to not be concerned with the various variances amongst different cloud providers. This exact same procedure would be what you'd use to take a server template that you're running in Amazon and also run it in GoGrid or Rackspace or Eucalyptus. So the second part to a server template is you know, the script or the dynamic configuration. So a server template consists of some boot scripts, which when, the, when you launch, it'll configure the server dynamically. And as you can see here, we have some of these write scripts that install the database, or, in the, in a, or down here we have some write scripts that install Rails or Capistrano, and also install our application code onto the server itself. Well, what scripting language is this, David? So a write script you know, can be written in you know, Python, Bash, Ruby, really any type of scripting language. And the, the bonus is, with a write script, you can pass environment variables to these scripts as inputs. Okay, and did you have to create this? Does a customer actually have to build this server template? No, RightScale provides a whole host of public server templates. Um, and these come strictly from our customer needs, like Rails, Rails server templates, PHP server templates, and even MySQL templates. Um, furthermore, you can use these, use these server templates in write scripts and then modify them to customize them to your own needs. Okay, so all of the configuration of this instance, it's using a write image, which is an AMI, and all the configuration of that image is being done dynamically by executing a series of boot scripts when that server boots up. Exactly, and that's important because then you're only, hand, you're only managing one AMI. So you're, not, you're, you're reducing your image maintenance time. Got it. So you mentioned environment variables and inputs. So what's, what's an example of an input? So an example of an input would, let's say, would be you know, your website DNS name. Or you know, if you have you know, certain parameters that you want to tweak your application. So in this case, I can you know, rename my application or you know, set um, different um, application username and passwords for my, for my database. So the beauty here is that you can determine which inputs are fixed and which are variable and have them associated with a specific template, which can be used to launch server after server after server. Exactly. And the greatest part about that is you can use one server template to create two different servers, depending on the inputs that you set. Now, if I make changes, are changes easy to track? I'm glad you brought that up because in the, in the last uh, demo with the AMI, it's, you have to make manual changes, and then you have to kind of record those changes somewhere to know, you know what's on your image. With the server template and write script model, um, we have a, a, a versioning system. So you can keep different revisions of all your write scripts and server templates, so you have a complete history of that server. Got it. So secondly, we have a server template consists of operational scripts. And as Josh said, these can be run at runtime, or you can automatically run scripts, um, depending on the alerts and escalations that you do set up. So what, what would be an example of an operational script that someone would use? So an example, let's say your application server, one of your application servers is, you know, there's some bugs. So you want to deregister that with the load balancer. 
So you can go ahead and manually deregister that application server and take it offline. And lastly, a server template consists of decommission scripts, which are, are executed when the server is terminated. And this allows for any last second cleanup that you may, that you may want. And for example, you, want, you may want to deregister it from a load balancer when a server goes down. Okay. Great. So that's, that's helpful, David. Thank you. So it sounds like, you know, as a key takeaway with server templates, it's all about static versus dynamic. And I think if I was to sum this up, it's really eliminating the need to manage in images, which becomes very cumbersome. You have to rebundle them. That takes time. Dealing with version control is very problematic. So if you think about from a business process standpoint, and we like to really make sure that people understand, a TCO analysis is not just about actually consuming IT resources. It's about the change to your business process about how you'd approach it. So for example, when you're using machine images, your overhead when it comes to common lifecycle tasks would include the time it takes to make a change, times the number of live images you need to make that change to, plus the time it takes to retrieve, launch, and change the number of stored images. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. However, when you're using this dynamic configuration model, you know, when you're operating at this layer of abstraction using server templates, your overhead simply consists of the time to change, and that's it. You're changing a single input variable, or you're changing a single write script, and then the next server you launch is done under that new configuration. It becomes a very repeatable process. So finally, let's talk about you know, commercial deployments. I mean, obviously, most companies who are running commercial deployments in the cloud are not running single servers. So what does it mean when you need to manage and set up a multi-server environment? What are the common things you need to be concerned with? And how would you approach that in the cloud? Um, within RightScale, we call these deployments. And deployments are simply bringing together all of the servers associated with an application environment under one unified management process. So you can manage at a deployment level. You can monitor at the deployment level. You can have a set of global input parameters uh, that will be associated with the entire deployment. A deployment can range from two servers up to several thousand. It's really up to you. So why don't we now take a look at uh, a sample deployment and also focus on a couple common lifecycle tasks, you know, including how would I go about changing a global configuration, what does it look like to actually monitor at a deployment level, so seeing multiple different servers uh, and their behavior. And then actually two specific cases of, of common tasks that you'd interact with a deployment. You know, one is how do I make a change? And then another one would be you know, a more robust, you know, we want to completely test uh, a, new, a new architecture for our site. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So David, why don't you show us a, a deployment here? Sure. So as Josh said, a deployment is really a heterogeneous group of servers. Um, in this deployment, we have a standard four server setup with two Rails front end servers and a master and slave database. Now, this fifth server is a server that's sending synthetic traffic to our two front ends to enable the, the IO scaling in the array. So, David, I noticed that fifth server is actually located in a different zone than the other four. Are you saying that you can actually have a deployment include multiple different availability zones? Yes, you can have multiple, avail multiple availability zones, but you can also have multiple clouds. So, you can configure your so, you, so all your servers can be managed under one umbrella of the deployment, no matter if it's in a different availability zone or a different cloud. Okay. So the next thing with the deployment is the ability to you know, have global configuration. So that's where the inputs come in. So as you saw in the last demo with the server templates, you can kind of aggregate your list of inputs. But in this case, all your servers within the deployment inherit, inherit the common values. And for example, common values would be where your application is, where your database, app, database server is located. And lastly, you know, where's, what's your website DNS name? And, second, and then where's your SVN app repository? So every single time a server is launched, it'll grab the latest code from your app repository and then install it onto the server. So specifically in some, you have a collection of environment variables that are associated with a single deployment. Mm -hmm. and, all, and all the servers inherit those common values. Got it. And now, another great thing about the deployments is the, the, the ability to monitor at a deployment level. So you can see all what's, what's going on with all your servers within your deployment. So as you can see here, I have some monitoring graphs for the Rails front end A and B. But if I wanted to add a second graph for, say, you know, to check up on our database, I can select our database, and then I have a whole host of graphs that I can choose from. I can click a graph, and then I can save it. So then I have one unified view of my deployment so I can see what's going, you know, what's going wrong, if, if, if anything's going wrong with it. 
That's great. So let's talk about a couple common uh, life cycle tasks of what it's like to manage at a deployment level. So you know, the first thing that I think is important to note is deployments allow you to predefine the entire nature of a cluster of servers. So what cluster of servers are consist of, how many servers are in there, what you want their behavior to be. You can also define things like server arrays, multiple server arrays. So arrays will grow and shrink uh, based on uh, system metrics that you're monitoring and rules that you set up. However, you can do this before or without associating with the actual physical resources. And the key thing to note is when you're not associating with physical resources from one of the infrastructure providers like Amazon, you're not incurring any costs. So you can define your environment with a cluster of servers, store that, make changes to it, but not incur any costs to do so. So very, very powerful. The, the second thing is what you see here with this run rate. Um, so deployments allow you to, for the first time really as a system administrator, have real-time visibility into your consumption rates. Um, that helps with capacity planning needs and how much you're willing to invest in terms of scaling up and down. You can set parameters like that. It also drives a lot of solutions around cost accounting. So just think about now you have the ability to directly associate the exact down to the hour or day IT resource spend on a variety of different initiatives you're getting from all different types of departments throughout your company. So very, very powerful stuff in terms of how you can leverage uh, deployments in that regard. So David, why don't you show us uh, how you make a change in a deployment? Sure. So about a year ago, you know, our, our company photo on our website was about you know, around 20 people, but since then we've grown. So now I need to make, a, you know, make an update to our website. So let's go take a look at the current website I'm running right now. And as you can see, we have our old picture um, on the page. Now I want to update that photo. So all I have to do is go to the scripts tab and then look for my update um, update application uh, write script. So this, this would be an example where you're going to use an operational script, is that right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use an operational script to run this um, write script over many servers. So not just one, because I need to run it on both my front end servers. So you mean you, you don't have to go in and SSH in and reconfigure each server at the command line? Exactly. So from the deployment level, I can execute, execute a script across any servers in my deployment. So what I'll do is I'll select both of these servers, and then I'll go ahead and run the script. And in a moment under recent activity, you'll see that the job has been queued up, and shortly after, the job will be executed. But I want to check one more thing. I just want to make sure I don't have any servers within my array. Okay, I don't. So let's go back to the website and, and look at my uh, look at my update. David, that's that's not a very good looking crew. <laughs> As you can see below, though, you can order order these poster up. Uh, you know, however many orders you want. That's that's great. I'm sure the audience is is really looking forward to doing that. Okay, so, Van, so I mean, very powerful stuff. I mean, what you just did with a few clicks of the mouse is you updated all the respective servers in that deployment um, with this new photo now without having to deal with anything on the command line, nor did you have to go server by server. Great. Another common lifecycle task is, you know, say marketing. They want to take our current production servers, and then they want to do some testing on it. So what we can do is we can click clone. And by cloning this production server, we, uh, we create an exact replica of this running environment or these, these server definitions in a new deployment. So once it's cloned, I can rename it to the marketing website. And then from there, all I have to do is change a couple of input parameters before I launch, before I launch this deployment. And this cloning process, David, I mean, this can be used to actually relaunch this entire configuration on the same cloud in the same availability zone in the case of Amazon, but also on, let's say, GoGrid or Rackspace? That's right. And you can also do it, you know, deploy it into multiple clouds for, you know, redundancy purposes. So I think this is, this is a really interesting point, because you think about the old model of doing things, you have to go through, you know, in, internal infighting on procedures and budget allocation to get the resources to do this, and then you go through procurement timelines and setting up these servers. I mean, what you've done here is simply chain, you know, take the exact production environment that you're currently running and replicate that environment. So now marketing or test and dev can do whatever configuration changes that they want. Exactly, and it's a good point to, uh, to point out that this did not affect the production servers at all. This just created the exact you know, server definitions and deployment definitions of our production environment. So now, in order not to, not to mess with our uh, production environment, we just have to change a couple of input parameters, like where our test database is located. And furthermore, I want to update it with the new, the new site code. So all I have to do is scroll down to the SVN app repository. And again, these are the same global inputs that you showed us before. 
So these are associated with all the servers in that cluster. Exactly. So when I start up the servers within this deployment, it'll, be, it'll check out my new code and use the test database rather than the production database. Got it. So let me go ahead and save these changes. So after I've saved these changes, I can go ahead and launch those servers. And now marketing has a separate, um, you know, separate staging servers to, 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 to deploy their code. Now, what, let's say whatever marketing came up with is the cat's meow, and we want to move our production environment over. Is that easy to do now? Exactly. So it's the whole point of rolling forward with the cloud. So the ability to, you know, point point your uh, Elastic IPs to the to the new staging servers, and now you're rolling forward. And furthermore, if, if I found out that this was just the worst idea in the world and we want to complete, completely jettison these resources, I can just simply shut down this deployment and the meter stops running. Exactly. Great. Very powerful stuff. Well, thanks, David. Appreciate you showing us that. So I think just some key takeaways on deployments, um, and we only scratched the surface on really what's possible here, but you know, it's all about essentially how it simplifies the ongoing management tasks that developers and system administrators face. So the ability to monitor and respond at a deployment level, um, the ability to share a common set of input parameters across multiple servers. Um, this notion of being able to leverage deployments across zones, you know, which again are separate data centers within Amazon, as well as across clouds. You know, you're not having to worry about reconfiguring the deployment if you want to take something that's running on Amazon and also have a separate environment running on another cloud provider that right scale supports. Um, so I think, you know, in sum, it's really about being able to work more efficiently and in a highly automated manner. So in summary, before we turn things over to questions, you know, hopefully what you've been able to get out of this is really this notion of a new approach to IT. And hopefully there's two key things that will resonate here, which is, you know, one part of it is about how things are changing now that you can access and configure IT resources on demand and only pay for what you use. But as important is the impact it has on your business process. So this notion that Yuri mentioned of agile deployment. So changing the way you think, you know, now that servers are not a problem, you know, they're a very cheap commodity. You know, what happens? How does it change your business when you can throw servers at a problem? When you actually stand up a robust testing environment in a matter of minutes instead of days or weeks. The second key point is this is real. There are companies doing real commercial deployments in the cloud today, companies ranging from a couple guys in a garage to Fortune 100 companies. So we have lots and lots of different use cases that we'd be more than happy to share. Some are publicly available on our website, rightscale.com, uh, and also some we can give you examples and even referrals into some of our customers that are willing to talk about what they've done and how they leverage the cloud. So we really, really encourage you to not get, not think that the cloud is something that you're not ready for. What we found is every company, large and small, has a cloud-friendly workload today. So get, get on board, start learning, try something out. The investment is very, very minimal to start taking advantages and learning about what the cloud's all about. And then finally, just how easy it is to get started. Um, even doing the most basic thing requires just a few clicks of the mouse, accessing a machine image, and launching it. So we encourage you, you know, on our dime, go sign up for rightscale.com, our trial account, and just launch a server. You know, see what that's all about. But then also, you know, as you're thinking more and more about how do I move something of production into the cloud, you're going to get into various different elements of configuration management and multi-server environments that our management system is specifically tailored to address. So we encourage you to try some of that out as well. So with that, I want to thank everyone for listening. And now let's, uh, a couple things, we're going to open up for questions, but just as a reminder here on some housekeeping, um, we'd be more than happy to take you through a live demo one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you'd like to take advantage of that, simply just send us an email at sales at right scale, or give us a call. We're more than happy to consult you on what may be possible for you today in the cloud and take you through a couple use cases and more specific examples one-on-one. -on -one. Um, again, we do offer both free trial as well as free developer accounts. So you can try out 10 hours of server time on rightscale.com. Or if you happen to have cloud credentials of your own, um, go ahead and enter them in rightscale. And you can use a free version of rightscale for as long as you want. Um, so really, really encourage you to try something out today. You know, get on board and start learning. And then finally, uh, we have a whole host of various different webinars focused on you know, general topics as well as very specific use cases that we've done with some partners. So all of those can be found at rightscale.com slash webinars. And this webinar, the audio and the slides will be made available. Um, usually it takes us about a day, so look for that uh, tomorrow. 
So with that, I want to thank everyone again, and let's, uh, let's turn it over now and start addressing some of these questions. And we'll stick around and keep the Q&A log open uh, for a few minutes afterwards. So if we don't get to your question right now, uh, our apologies in advance, and we'll certainly follow up with you after the webinar completes. So here's a question. If I use RightScale on Amazon, um, can I do this directly with Amazon, or am I stuck with just RightScale? So no, you're certainly not uh, not stuck anywhere. So right now, our customers uh, that are using RightScale on Amazon actually have two separate relationships. So they do need to go get their own Amazon credentials and then enter them back into the RightScale system. Um, your costs in terms of using Amazon will depend on the instance sizes. It will depend on the time you're actually running the server, the bandwidth consumed, and your storage objects within S3. Um, those costs are based on actual usage, uh, and you'll get billed monthly from Amazon. Um, RightScale's model works a little bit differently. We're delivering our service as a software as a service. Uh, so it starts with a base subscription fee, which includes a certain number of server hours under management. And then there are additional fees uh, if you exceed that. And then also a component of that is our onboarding process. Um, again, what we've found is that customers need and want help adopting best practices, uh, how they move to the cloud. Um, so we have, uh, within our services organization, as well as through partnerships that we've set up, we have the ability to essentially hold customers' hands through the process, help them identify what an appropriate cloud workload uh, would be like, and help them get up and running using best practices. So there's another question up here, David, I see on uh, public and private clouds. So can right, can right skill manage across private and public clouds? Uh, yet. So that's a great question. Um, so a couple things that are very topical and very timely that we've announced recently. Um, this is starting with a technology from Eucalyptus Systems, Inc. And what that technology allows you to do is to actually stand up within your own data center environment, stand up a private cloud. Um, RightScale fully supports Eucalyptus. Uh, during that uh, installation process of Eucalyptus, you'll have an option at the end to register that cloud uh, with RightScale. And once you register that cloud, your eucalyptus-enabled private cloud will appear in your cloud menu in the exact same way that you saw the Amazon cloud appear today. Um, so this is available today. You can go to eucalyptus uh, systems and download it for free. It is open source, and there's a free version of RightScale that works with that. Um, so we encourage you to try it out. This is a technology preview, so we'll be building additional functionality uh, over, over time. Um, but you can get started today. And I guess uh, another question on that was, can you expand on the cross-cloud deployments? Um, you know, this is another area of, um, of uh, emphasis that we like to make sure customers and, and users understand, which is really distinguishing between what's practical versus what's technologically feasible. Um, the reality is most customers uh, can function just fine within one cloud. Okay? But you probably heard a lot of talk about things like cloud bursting, you know, seamlessly rolling over between various different clouds. Um, the technicalities behind that and the practical use cases for that are really limited to this point. What we see more of being practical and what we do support is the ability to actually split your deployment or the ability to move things around. So you have one state to one cloud using that cloning process and be able to uh, run your production environment in another. So have the ability to fail over and address certain business continuity requirements as the case may be. Um, in the case of a private cloud, in terms of why you want to set up, there was a question about a hybrid cloud situation. When would that come into play? Um, that would really come into play if you have specific application needs that would require one aspect of your deployment to be locked down in a more hardened environment. Uh, so a common example would be, say you want to run, run your database locally uh, and you want to run your app servers out in the public cloud and take advantages of the, uh, of the scaling. So that's exactly a great, uh, great scenario and great example that RightScale will support in its hybrid cloud capabilities using, uh, using Eucalyptus. Here's another question. How does scale when app servers connect to the back-end services? Uh, services are usually tied to IPs. So how would you deploy more of those services when the application depends on such IPs? The way our server templates are built is you have the two front ends that have the IPs associated with them. Now the, the back end application servers don't register with a public IP, they have a private IP address. So when they're launched, they'll go ahead and register with the two front end servers with their private IP address. And the two front ends will then distribute the load.
between themselves and the uh, in the back end application servers. So another interesting question is 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 right scale is the right scale platform itself running on a cloud? So the answer there is yes. You know, we we eat our own dog food. Um, right scale runs on right scale, and right scale runs uh, to date in in Amazon's EC2 environment. So what's happening as our customers scale up and down? The core right scale platform is also scaling up and down along with our customer needs. So yes, right scale is run in the cloud. Uh, we actually don't own any infrastructure uh, of our own, so it's all it's all uh, adopting and leveraging cloud computing. So another question is: On AWS, is load balancing included, um, and does right scale allow load balancing across uh, heterogeneous clouds, say at AWS and Rackspace? So AWS is coming out with you know their load balancing. With RightScale, we provide server templates for uh, an HA proxy uh, load balancer template. Um, when it, Amazon releases their load balancer service, you know, it'll be included or incorporated into, into the RightScale dashboard. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point, David. So, as a rule of thumb, and RightScale has been adopting this um, uh, this process since day one. Any innovation that Amazon comes out with, and they come out with a lot at a high frequency, we want to make sure that it's available for use at the time of launch that Amazon releases it. So anything that you can do directly with Amazon, you can also access within RightScale. Um, so things like Elastic Block Store, their EBS service, is available within RightScale. Load balancing isn't yet released, but when that is, that will also be available within RightScale. You know, our focus is really more about tying all these pieces together, so dealing with the complexity within a single cloud, but also across multiple clouds. Um, we don't focus really on any one particular uh, feature set, so that's why when Amazon is able to do advancements and things like load balancing, we're more than happy to adopt what they've done and be able to not worry about a, a particular piece of the equation. So David, why don't we do, uh, why don't we do one more question here, and then again, we'll keep this Q&A log uh, open um, for uh, for as long as the questions coming in, so assume about 20 minutes or so. So what uh, I guess we'll end here with what technology does a cloud provider need to have in order to manage it with right scale? Um, I'm assuming this means private cloud, but why don't we scratch the surface on a few things and then please send us an email. We'll happy to follow up in more detail. Um, so we look to support all the major public clouds that are out there. Um, so companies like Amazon with their AWS, Rackspace with their cloud servers, that involves right scale programming to that respective cloud's API. Uh, when it comes to private cloud, there are several different enabling technologies that are out in the market today. Um, Eucalyptus is the one that we have chosen to start with first. Uh, again, that is available, so just eucalyptussystems.com, go ahead and download that. It's free, and the version within right scale is free. There are some core requirements that you will need to have. Uh, for example, it would have to be either KVM or, or Zen in terms of your, uh, your virtualization uh, component. But for the most part, you can take uh, a current server environment that you have in your data center today and hopefully with minimal reconfiguration, uh, download Eucalyptus and, and give it a spin. But please, we're happy to go in, uh, into more detail uh, when you get a second and just send us an email and we'll follow up accordingly. Um, I guess two other things here. We have we have a few more minutes here before we terminate the audio. Um, are there any tutorials? So yes, lots and lots and lots. Um, we encourage you to go to help.rightscale.com. You'll see several video tutorials that are available on a whole variety of topics, ranging from how do I auto scale to how do I bundle an image. Um, you can also go visit our channel on YouTube. We have a RightScale channel on YouTube where you'll see some great videos on. Uh, using server templates or using GrightGrid, which is our batch processing service. Uh, and then you can also go to uh, both our wiki and our webinars page. Um, our wiki is a very comprehensive resource for all things RightScale. Think of it as a how-to. Um, that's located at wiki.rightscale.com. And that includes actually several different uh, tutorials of how to set up uh, a multi-server environment within RightScale. So another question here is, I have a bulk process processing environment which cannot be predicted for timely schedules. Um, does RightScale provide the ability to scale processing units uh, based or demand requirements? Um, the answer to that is we have another solution called RightGrid, um, which scales based off the number of uh, jobs that you have in an Amazon S2S queue. So it's different from the scalable photo site, which was scaling based off you know your CPU idle value. 
Here is the amount, the amount of the number of jobs in your queue, which you can then, uh, you know, uh, state or dictate. And you will scale based off the number of jobs and spin up that many servers. So I guess we'll, we'll keep doing a couple more here, David. It seems like a lot of people are sticking around. Um, so this next one is, I don't want RightScale or Amazon to view HIPAA protected info. So interesting question, and actually I can put a little context around this because we have received approval from one of our customers that was faced with this very issue. Um, so we have one customer that does health claims uh, processing in the cloud using RightScale. Uh, the company is called TC3. And if you want to Google them, you can find uh, some press that's been written about TC3. So specifically, they're looking for fraudulent claims uh, on healthcare claims. So obviously, they're subject to HIPAA. What they've done uh, using RightGrid is prior to submitting their data, so prior to uploading their data to S3, uh, S3 again is Amazon's simple storage service, that data was sanitized to comply with HIPAA. So essentially, it was, it was made generic so that it couldn't be identified uh, back to any one individual. Then that data was uploaded, and then using RightGrid, they were able to perform very complex batch processing tasks to run their algorithms on thousands of machines to get through that batch processing very, very quickly. Um, so there are lots of ways that you can take advantage of the cloud, even if you're subject to requirements such as HIPAA. The other question is, how do you support DB scalability? I have more than two instances for the DB. So you can use the, uh, the right scale MySQL EBS templates that we do provide. Um, and then you can add your own scripts to register itself or to automatically create an A record um, with your DNS provider. So you can then put that MySQL template into an array. And every single time that instance is launched, it'll then register it with your DNS provider. Great. Another thing to note on, on DB scalability is we work with a variety of partners to help publish a variety of different server templates that are geared towards common workloads. So there's a couple partners that we'll be announcing shortly that will do things around DB sharding, DB replication, and, and various different ways to scale database clusters. So look for those in the server template library and coming to right scale soon. Another question was asked, do we have a template for Postgres for a Postgres database? And as Josh says, we do have you know, some providers who will be coming out with that shortly. Then we have, uh, is there a difference between usage costs for public and private clouds? Um, another great question. So just to reiterate, the public clouds, so e.g. Amazon Web Services, uh, you're going to pay for what you actually use. So CPU cycles, storage objects, bandwidth consume, um, that is based on actual consumption rate. Um, it starts at a small instance at $0.10 cents an hour, and it is in one-hour increments. So for a very, very low cost, you can get up and running and try out something. In the case of a private cloud, that's your infrastructure. Um, so Eucalyptus is provided open source, so you can download that for free uh, today. Um, they do have resources available if you need help, professional service uh, resources. So you can hire them to do that, but if you just want to try it out, that's free for you to use. Um, RightScale also offers a version of its developer uh, edition that's available for use with Eucalyptus at no charge. So if you want to get started and try out a private cloud that's Eucalyptus enabled, please do so. You can do it absolutely free and it's available today. But please keep in mind this is a technology preview. There will be a subsequent release that happens uh, in this fall. Um, but it is a good time to get started, get learning, figure out what your needs are, and we're more than happy to talk to you about architecting various solutions for you. So with that, I think, uh, I think we'll wrap up the audio portion now. Again, I want to thank everyone for sticking around. And we'll keep the Q&A log open. Uh, and then so feel free to ask any more questions that you want. We'll stick around for about another 20 minutes on the Q&A log, as long as questions keep coming in. And again, if we don't get to your question, our apologies. Uh, we will be following up directly with you uh, post-webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar will be made available, both audio uh, and the slides at rightscale.com slash webinars. So we encourage you to check it out. You can access all of our webinars there. And feel free to call us if you have any questions, and just want to talk about the cloud in general, want a demo of RightScale, or anything else that you're curious about, don't hesitate to ask. You know, our most important goal right now is to help you embrace cloud computing, teach you what's possible, help you understand the different methodologies you can embrace, and ultimately make your deployment successful. So thanks for listening, everyone, and have a great day.